In this video, I'm explaining the concept of mental infrastructure. And I think this concept is really useful if you want to think about which technologies will take over, which technologies will develop, and how long it's going to take the population to adopt a new technology. In particular, I think there are some technologies that are brilliant and would be useful and may spread like wildfire if they were introduced in 1930, but right now the population um, has a certain mental infrastructure to it and they're not yet ready to adopt that particular technology. So that's how to think of it, but this video is really just explaining what is mental infrastructure. All right, so we can make the analogy to physical infrastructure. So get a picture in your head of road systems and sewer systems and subway systems. That's all physical infrastructure. And if you want, you can think of digital infrastructure as being the internet and the percent of the population that has access to the internet and the percentage of the population with an email account. All of that stuff could be considered digital infrastructure. So the dictionary definition of infrastructure is the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. And they give us examples, buildings, roads, and power supplies. So one characteristic of infrastructure is the fact that other goods and services are built on top of it and the building of things and the efficiency of things depends on that infrastructure. So what is mental infrastructure? Well, mental infrastructure is just going to be the common understanding that people have of something. And oftentimes this is a common understanding about how to interact with a system. So one example would be the layout of a keyboard. The fact that everybody kind of learns to type on a specific type of keyboard means that um, you can have a computer system anywhere in the world and people can just come up and start typing on it. They don't have to learn the new way of typing using a different organization of the keys. Another example is calling 911. Another example is the way that the trash system works. No matter where in the country you move, you probably have an idea that probably one day of the week the trash person comes by. Most people know how to line up or queue up if they're waiting for something. You get in line behind the person in front of you. And now that COVID's happening, we know that if there's dots on the floor, that indicates how far away you should stay from someone who's ahead of you in the line. And really, if you think about rewinding to the year 1500, for example, maybe queuing or lining up wasn't a thing and people wouldn't have known, oh, if there's these sort of ribbons that are, um, that are outlined in a certain way, that those ribbons mean you need to go through the line in that order. Um, they might have seen the, the sort of lineup ribbons and have no idea what those meant or how to interact with those. So the common knowledge about how to interact with a system, how to interact with a bureaucratic system or with a corporation, that understanding makes it much more efficient for us to interact with the world we live in. Other examples of mental infrastructure, we kind of know that when there's certain signs in front of bathroom doors, it's either male or female. When people see a revolving door, they know how to interact with it. All of these things, if you were to rewind to the 15th century, people might not have necessarily known how to interact with our buildings and our streets and our system as it is today, but because this is somewhat unified across the world in terms of how we handle city building, it makes people's interaction with cities much more efficient. Now, when computers were coming on the scene and when the internet was first evolving, the developers and the designers knew that this would be an entirely new system for people to interact with. They didn't yet have the mental infrastructure about where to click. And now we've developed some really powerful intuitions about how to navigate an operating system, how to nav navigate a web browser. Well, if you go back and look at the different functionalities they were adding to web browsers and internet sites, a lot of those buttons had real world analogies. So let me give you a bunch of examples, and for each of these, there's sort of an online mental infrastructure that we've gotten used to, and there's also an analog, real-world um, system that is analogous in some way. Think about the desktop. 
Like when operating systems were new, how do you think about what is an operating system? How does it organize information? And the fact that we had a clear picture in our, in our head of what are our desktops like and the fact that it's easy to grab things that we use a lot, that was a really useful analogy. The trash bin, the fact that we don't need to keep files all the time, we can get rid of them. The fact that they introduced the internet with the idea of surfing the web gave people a sense for the way to interact with the information. It's sort of a huge amount of information and you're just sort of surfing on top of it, going back and forth. You have the freedom to just sort of touch a little here, touch a little there, and that it was very directive in terms of how to interact with the internet. Web address, the fact that we have real addresses for businesses and addresses for homes, meant that web address and email address were very intuitive. The fact that icons for files really did show a manila file that people used for their filing cabinets for years, that was really helpful in, in orienting people about how do I organize information when I'm first learning to use a computer. Having those real world analogies meant that the designers of the internet were building on the mental infrastructure that we already had before the internet existed. And it, it still took us a while to sort of get used to what is an efficient way of browsing the web, what are some good habits, and so by say 2005 people had developed a very intuitive sense of how to interact with the internet. At that point we had a really strong internet mental infrastructure, but social media was just coming on the scene and it had to develop its own mental infrastructure which it did also through analogies to mental infrastructures that existed before social media. So introducing the thumbs up that was a very intuitive thing as a way of validating someone. The upvote. People understood what a vote was and that it had some impact on the outcome. News feed. What does it mean that it's feeding you this information? What's sort of the passivity of that? What's the relationship between you and your news feed? Well, it's personalized, it's given to you, it's meant to be edifying. Now we can, uh, <laughs> we can debate that looking back, but Certainly the mental infrastructure that social media firms used to help us figure out how to interact with them, that was an important part of the process. And in some ways, the early social media sites were building this infrastructure that made way for more complex types of social media that have evolved over the years. What does it mean to become a follower? And you really do get a mental image of like, the fans following their, their favorite band around, almost this groupie image. Ooh, groupie. That would be a good uh, mental image for social media companies in the future to use. Hmm. Now that social media has been on the scene for a while, all of these things are intuitive and we have the mental infrastructure without needing the original prompt. Um, so in some ways we have this new social media mental infrastructure and we're ready to build the next infrastructure for the next iteration of social media or the next iteration of whatever the online digital world is going to bring us. And you can do the same exercise that I did comparing say 1980 to 1500. You can compare 2020 to the year 2000 and say if someone in the year 2000 who was just encountering the internet for the first time if they went on one of these social media websites, would they even understand it? Or would they be completely overwhelmed by all of the different options and the different interactive ways of upvoting and downvoting and flagging? What does it mean to have a newsfeed? What, what do you mean by followers? What exactly is that relationship on social media? They would probably need some time to orient to that stuff. But because we've had this sort of slow progression of mental infrastructure, when a new social media app comes out, it is fairly intuitive for us. It kind of builds on the existing infrastructure and maybe adds a few extra features that we'll figure out once we've played around with it. But my guess is if we had to start from scratch learning a new app, in 2020 with the mental infrastructure of say 1980, it would be way too over overwhelming and we'd just give up. And to some degree, the slow evolution of mental infrastructure in terms of how we understand um, the way we interact with our online space, that's changing over time so that we're just ready for the next thing. And I think one thing that will determine which, um, which social media apps and which online platforms are going to be successful in the future is 
Do they hit the sweet spot building on our existing mental infrastructure and adding a little bit of new functionalities that maybe make nice analogies to the analog world or to other already existing mental infrastructure such that they're moving the edge of that boundary of our mental infrastructure at just the right pace. I really do think a lot of app developers have great ideas that the world might be ready for in five or ten years, but they're trying to introduce them too soon before we have the mental infrastructure to interact um, easily and efficiently with them. And I think this is something that innovators and entrepreneurs need to spend more time thinking about as they introduce new apps. In any case, I hope you find this useful. I found it really useful when I think about how technologies are going to evolve and what is the right pace of the evolution of new programs and new apps over time.